Well, welcome back to our consideration of the angels of God, those that stand by. And tonight we're going to look at the emotions and the characters of the angels of God. And we have considered many of these things as we've gone along, but I just summarized a few of these into this one last study, just to emphasize the fact that the life of the angels is interesting. They are required to use their initiative. They have a personal relationship with the people that they are dealing with, and they have feelings. And we're going to see many of those feelings as we go through this. Remember, their work is to represent God on the earth, especially the Yahweh angel Michael was God's personal representative on earth. To make God's will amongst the nations come to pass at the appointed times, and we saw Gabriel and Michael working on the divine timetable, moving nations into place according to God's plan. To care for God's people, they are ministering spirits sent forth to minister to the heirs of salvation. To reveal God's plans, Gabriel, of course, is the angel that talked with the prophets, the one who came to John. And we have Gabriel in the role of a communicator. To work for the ultimate salvation of God's people. So, you know, they work through our lives. They have the ultimate aim of getting us into the kingdom. They put us through various trials and tribulations sometimes, but always with the object that we might obtain to God's glory in the kingdom age. So it's the ultimate salvation that they are concerned about. Along the way, they have to increase our spiritual growth, and it's called the sealing of the servants of God where divine thinking is impressed upon their minds, and the angels do that by opening up to us the scriptures and putting things around us that we might be able to grow in wisdom and knowledge and understanding. And we are in training to take over their role in the age to come in relation to the mortal population that shall remain after Armageddon. So when we read in the Bible, we often find occasions where men talk to God or Yahweh face to face, and we need to understand the angels come to represent God, not themselves. As we said in the past, if you call the police, you want their help. It doesn't really matter who the policeman actually is. And so the angels' primary work is to come and to represent God and to do the will of God on the earth. But it doesn't mean they are not individuals. It doesn't mean they are robots or clones. They are beings with feelings and individuality. So they exist because God is sharing with them his work. God has been very gracious in expanding his glory into them, and he now shares his work with them. He's made them his immortal servants. They represent him to mortal men. They act for God and they watch for God. They're God's eyes everywhere in the earth. They watch over God's people. They direct the affairs of the nations. They stand by us to get us into the kingdom. They're not clones or robots. They're individuals with intense feelings. Let's look at some of those feelings. We're going to look at some of these individually, but they have love. Daniel was called the man greatly beloved. They have kinship. Abraham, I know him, said the angel. Friendship with Moses, he spoke to him as a man speaks to his friend. Righteous anger with Miriam and Aaron. Joy and happiness before the shepherds. Sadness over the plea of Moses to enter the land. A sense of achievement in the work with Darius and Cyrus. A sense of curiosity, asking questions and a dedication to service. I am thy fellow servant. So, they are some of the emotions we're going to deal with one by one. Let's just go through a few of them. Abraham and the Yahweh angel. Here's Abraham pleading for Lot. What if there's only 10 in the city of Sodom? And the angel says, I know him. I know him. I've got to tell him because this man I know will actually instruct his family and his servants and his household after him. And what he's going to learn here at this incident with Sodom will be very useful in them understanding the ways of God. But the angel said, I know him. It wasn't just God's knowing of this man. He was very much known and, and appreciated by this angel. And just going back to something we looked at before, but a beautiful comment from Robert Roberts about this particular incident. How useful also is the pitch of Abraham's discussion with the Elohim in illustrating the personal reality and the grace and the condescension of the angels, who though so harmless and sociable with Abraham, are to the enemies of God more formidable than the deadliest dynamite torpedo as the Sodomites experienced. The reflection is of practical value in view of the prospect exhibited to us in the gospel of one day, and that not a long distant one, of becoming acquainted with myriads of them and of sharing the wonderful exaltation which they enjoy as the immortal and powerful servants of Yahweh. And so we see in these angels, don't we, the character that we hope one day to display to the mortal population over which we shall rule. 
In the case of Lot, they accepted Lot's hospitality, even though they didn't need to. They were prepared to lie down. The angels are not indifferent to the wishes and comforts of others. They are the true gentlemen of the universe. They reflect the character of the eternal father of all, who is gracious, compassionate, and good. And so they are wonderfully real beings with feelings and with emotions and with character. Their care with Lot and his family, they took them by the hand to lead them out. They gave them time to appeal to their relatives. But in the end, they took them by the hand and led them out of the city. And so they were very careful with Lot and his daughters and his wife. We come to Daniel and we talk about the love of the angels. This is not just God's opinion of Daniel. This was Daniel was greatly beloved by the angels. O oh, man, greatly beloved. I am come to show thee, for you are greatly beloved. And you can imagine in these days when there were so few people keeping the ways of God, when the one nation that God had been working with was now decimated, the northern tribes carted off into a, to captivity, the tribes of Judah in Babylon, weeping, hanging their harps upon the willows. To whom would the angels look to be the person that would actually stand up for the things of God and to understand the things of God? To whom would they reveal the visions of God except Daniel and Ezekiel? He was a man greatly beloved because the angels were intensely interested in everything that Daniel did. And in the end, when Daniel was about to die, you can imagine the compassion with which the angel said, you go your way to the end be, for you shall rest and stand in thy lot at the end of days. And so they let Daniel depart into the grave in old age, assuring him when he would be in the resurrection and he would be one of those stars that would shine forever and ever in the kingdom of God. But there are times that the angels get angry. And as they work on the earth for God, they see Yahweh's honour challenged. And I want you to come back to the book of Numbers and just flick through a couple of cases in the book of Numbers where the anger of Yahweh is kindled. We have the case in Numbers 11. The people complained, it displeased Yahweh, and Yahweh heard it. Now, the Yahweh here is the Yahweh angel. This is the angel that God has sent to guide them through the wilderness, the one that dwelt in the cloud by day and in the fire by night. That angel that was with them through the wilderness, carried them all the days of the wilderness journeys. He gets angry. His anger was kindled, and his fire burned among them. In verse 20, we read about this particular incident, which was at Kibroth Atava. They got for a whole, they got quails for a whole month until it be loathsome unto you. You despise Yahweh, which is among you. So Yahweh is among them. So there was anger on this part of this angel for the, the ingratitude of these people. And then in verse 23, as Yahweh's hand waxed great, thou shalt see whether my word shall come to pass unto thee or not. And so the angel is, is, is quite agitated through this incident. And then we come down to verse 33 that he actually punishes those greedy people. And that's why it was called the graves of the greedy. Or the flesh was between their feet, teeth, ere it was even chewed. The wrath of Yahweh was kindled against the people, and Yahweh smote the people with a very great plague. So you have a great occasion of wrath where the people in their desire to go back to Egypt and to have flesh to eat, the angel gets very, very annoyed with them, and it's only the pleading of Moses that rescues the situation. The same in Numbers 12. And we see in verse 2 that the people are questioning, this is Miriam and Aaron, questioning Moses' authority and, and raising issues about the woman that he'd married. And it says there, and Yahweh heard their complaining. In verse 5, we, we see that Yahweh came down in the pillar of the cloud and stood at the door of the tabernacle. This is the angel that is right there with Miriam and Aaron. And they both came forth. And you can imagine how much they trembled when they came forth to this apparition now standing over the door of the tabernacle. Again, you've got the word stood there, which is the angel word. And then, of course, they are rebuked in, in verse 7 and 8. The angel says that Moses will behold the similitude of Yahweh, but you won't. Why are you, why are you talking about my servant Moses in such a way? And the angel is, gives them a very, very strong rebuke. And it says in verse 5, the anger of Yahweh was kindled against them and he departed. And so they were strongly rebuked by this angel. We know that Miriam was punished with leprosy. And again, Moses had to plead for her. In Numbers 14, we have the rejection of the land. And the, the again, the anger of Yahweh against that. Numbers 14 verse 11, Yahweh said unto Moses, How long will these people provoke me? How long will they, ere they believe me? 
for all the signs which I have showed them among them. I will smite them with pestilence and disinherit them. And again, you can see the anger of the angel coming through, that all the, the work that he's done through the wilderness for this whole long time is now coming to nothing. It's just people turn their backs and despise God's land. And there was good cause for the angel to be upset about that. And then we come to Numbers 22, and it's on the screen, the incident with Balaam, where Balaam was determined to go and to try and earn the wages of, of iniquity from the king of Moab, to curse this people that came out of Egypt. And God had said, you shouldn't go, you, you can't go because they're a blessed people. So he knew that he should not be going, but he kept pushing and pushing God. And sometimes when we push God, God makes it harder for us. And so he was given a sign. And, and the Elohim came to Balaam at night and said, if the men come to call thee, rise up and go with them. Now, there's no record of the men coming to call him in the morning. You can imagine the angel made them sleep very soundly to see what Balaam would do. Well, Balaam got up early, saddled his ass, and off he went, seeking the rewards of divination. And it says, and God's anger was kindled because he went. Or it says in Rotherham, because he was actually going. And the angel was upset that he was actually going, that he'd actually ignored all the warnings and all the things that had been said before had been ignored. He's actually going. And so the angel then stands in the way. Again, the angel standing in the way for an adversary against him. And again, the angel tries to rescue Balaam from his own greed and stupidity. But again, you can see the anger of that, 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 that angel that was there. God's anger was kindled because he actually went. And right through the incident with Balaam, you have interaction with an angel. And it's something which is interesting when you actually explore who Balaam probably was. Well, when we come to Isaiah 63, we have the prophetical description, the inspired description of the work of that angel in the wilderness with the children of Israel. And notice the, the personal terms about this angel. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bare them and carried them all the days of old. But they revealed and vexed his Holy Spirit. And there again is that the angel and the Holy Spirit are the same thing. Therefore, he was turned to be their enemy, and he fought against them. And again, you get that idea of the angel in the wilderness being vexed by the, the, the stubbornness and the stupidity of the children of Israel in always wanting to go back to Egypt and not to push ahead to the land that they were promised. And then we come to perhaps, I think in the Bible, perhaps the most close personal relationship we're aware of in the Bible, and that is the angel, the Yahweh angel with Moses. And it's a relationship that extends over some 40 years, and it becomes a very personal friendship. Now, the Yahweh Elohim met with Moses when he was called back into Egypt. And we know, of course, that was a fairly a poor start. Moses kept on trying to duck out of the responsibility he then failed to circumcise his own child, and there was considerable anger at that point with Moses from, from heaven, and the angel was seeking to kill him, and it's only the intervention of his wife that actually saved that situation. So Moses makes a fairly poor start in this relationship. And then he's promised that there would be an angel sent with him, and, and when the, after the golden calf, when the angel was removed and an ordinary angel was given, which is a very interesting term, but just an angel, just an ordinary angel, not a, an archangel. And Moses is not satisfied with that. He, he pleads with that Yahweh angel to come back. And the angel says, my presence shall go with you, Moses. I, I don't like them. I don't like the children of Israel and their faithlessness, but I will go with you. And so the angel comes with Moses. And it's called in Isaiah 63, the angel of his presence. And they had a great relationship. There would be, Moses would speak to him up on the mountain and Moses set up a tent of, of, of witness, a tent of a congregation, where he could go outside the camp with sometimes or into that tent at times, and the angel would then appear to him face to face as a man speaks to his friend. And they developed this very close relationship over the years when Moses constantly had to plead for him to forgive the children of Israel their transgressions, and the angel in most cases accepted his prayer and his plea. On the mountain, when Moses went up to the mountain after the golden calf and said, show me thy glory, the angel passed by and showed him part of his glory on that mountain. But the important thing was they had a friendship, and that was a friendship that was to last the whole 40 years of Moses, last 40 years of his life. 
But you can imagine the sadness, can't you, when you come to that incident at the end of Moses' life where Moses is now being told that he must appoint Joshua to, to lead the people into the promised land and he's not allowed to go in because of his transgression at the rock where he said that and he smote the rock twice and said, must we bring forth water? And he didn't sanctify God in the eyes of the people on that occasion. He broke the type that was being portrayed there. And so it was appointed that he not go into the land. But, no, but Moses was desperate, and he actually asked his friend, the angel, again and again, I pray thee, let me go over and see that good land that is beyond Jordan, the goodly mountain, Lebanon. But Yahweh was wroth with me for your sakes, and would not hear me. And Yahweh said unto me, let it suffice thee, speak no more unto me of this matter. And can't you imagine the sadness of that angel as he had to say to his friend Moses, Moses, I hear what you're saying. I understand your feelings, but I can't do that. Let's not talk about that again. Please do not raise that question again. And, and what a wonderful relationship that was between Moses and his angel. And then, of course, as we saw before, when time came for him to die, he showed him all the land. And I believe he took him on an aerial journey of the land because you cannot see all of those places listed there from any mountain in Moab. He showed him all the land and he then buried him in a valley. And no doubt when the time of the resurrection comes, that's exactly where Michael the archangel will be going to find his friend Moses. So there is great sadness in amongst the angels. And of course, there is sadness when we disappoint them in the way that we live our lives. The personal relationship, well, this is a beautiful comment of the angel to John when John tries to worship the angel of the revelation. Don't do that, John. I'm your fellow servant and of your brethren, the prophets, and of them that keep the sayings of this book, worship God. And you get a sense in there, not only are they automatically have the humble idea of being servants, but they love the prophets. They love those who stood up for God against all the odds who were stoned and persecuted and sawn asunder and imprisoned and all the terrible things that happened to God's prophets. But they also love those that keep the sayings of this book. And we can be in that class, brethren and sisters. We might not be able to be prophets, but we can keep the sayings of this book. And we have the testimony of Jesus, which is the spirit of the prophets, to go out and to preach the work and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to those who will listen and to those who don't want to listen. That's the spirit of the prophets. And the angels love the brethren and sisters who have the mind and the spirit of the prophets to speak the words of God, come what may, and to be those that keep the sayings of his book. So there's a great sense of a personal relationship that they have with us. Again, I keep quoting the words of Zacharias' prophecy where he said to Zerubbabel, you will finish this house. And when you've finished it, when the work is done, when the temple is completed, you will know, you will fully appreciate that Yahweh of armies sent me unto you. And that's the personal relationship that that angel had with Zerubbabel and with Joshua a very personal thing. You will one day understand just how much I've done behind the scenes. And we will have that angelic character that they have today, privileged to serve God and his people, willing to serve others, patient, gentle and kind, personally involved in caring for the saints, humble and gracious, joyful, often rejoicing and singing. All of those things are part of the, the joyous age to come that angels are now showing us what it's like to share divine nature. If angels are dedicated to service, to the care and the fostering of spiritual growth in God's children, so should we be. If that's the work that God has assigned his children to do, that they should look after the younger members of the family to bring them into the eternal life that he's prepared for them. If they're dedicated to serve and go on serving through their existence, then we should be of no problems in serving our brethren and sisters in any capacity that we can. The Apostle Paul learned something from the words of the Lord Jesus Christ. I've showed you all things, how that so labouring you ought to support the weak. And to remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. And the angels are happy to give, to serve, to do the things that God requires, to look after people and to give of themselves. Truly, the greatest blessing in life is when we can give rather than just to receive. 
And the angels teach us that great lesson, the lesson that Paul had learned from the Lord Jesus Christ. Our future, well, our future is to have a close relationship with Christ, the angels and the other saints, to lovingly guide the nations to God, to have feelings of joy and concern for the mortals under our control, to show compassion and patience like the angels do for us, to have everlasting interest, excitement and joy, and to know what real satisfaction is to actually be totally satisfied and happy with our lot, to know fulfilment that we're actually achieving the work of God through that thousand years, till it comes to the culmination when there shall be God all and in all. And all of those that we have brought to immortality shall be there again, equal unto the angels and equal unto the saints in that day. So our next study is about the questions that come from some of the quotes to do with angels.